beyond aesthetics. So color is a, a connection to place, something that represents locality and specificity of the places we live, a connection between what can be learned from plants and what that kind of infer about a place. So what I find is when I'm using these plants and you know figuring out the methods and all these things, I tend to do a little bit more research and figure out you know the histories of these plants and the symbolism and I think that really helps to build up a picture of um, a place and its ecologies and really builds a connection between myself and the, um, the the place that I'm interacting with. So I see color as a very essential part of place making and a central part of belonging as well. So the work I do, so basically the idea is that I'm building up a a pool of knowledge essentially to share in two very specific ways. So one of the ways I like to share the knowledge is by um, collaborating with other artists or designers who um, are already interested in, in connecting with land and place in their practice, but maybe don't, are not um, familiar with using colour as a way to do that. And so the other way I like to share this knowledge is in public projects. So with um, schools. So the, the picture on the right is um, a design which will be for 2022 for a renovation of St John's School in Lacey Green, where we'll have like an educational programme where the children will go foraging and we'll map walks, very similar to what I'll discuss today. But then the results of that will, will be that these colours then become a part of their learning environment and that will kind of reinforce all this knowledge when they see it every day. Um, on the left is a is a space that is going to be installed next year in the Barbican Centre, which is an inclusive space for people to come and basically enjoy the environment that the colours create and to to um, to base acknowledge after um, foraging sessions as well how colour can natural colours and local colour specifically can add a level of sort of specific value and locality and context to a space. So I just want to talk to you about my dye garden. So I've had the dye garden at Grimstack Farm now for the past year. And during that time, I've also been foraging a lot and I've often questioned the purpose of a dye garden when there's so much to forage. But what I've found is that dye gardens are actually very important if there are things that you want to use in large quantities where you don't want to damage the source you don't want to take too much so that you know the damaging the plants you're damaging the the resources for the birds and insects etc and second of all it's really useful for growing and experimenting with plants that just are not native to the area so it does really serve a purpose but what i would say is for for natural dyeing it's not essential, but it's it's a really good place to experiment. Um, this is my dye garden. This was in June, I think. So this is everything still looks quite small, <laughs> but um, it's a really useful way to almost have a sort of library of what um, what you use or what you know. So if there's something that I really love for when I'm foraging if I really love to use it, but for convenience's sake, it's really good to have it also in the garden. So you, there's always um, an abundance of it, well, seasonally, and it's easily accessible and you know where to find it and you know you're not damaging the, the, um, the wild plants as well. So I, it's always good to set up a space for natural dyeing. So I actually quite a lot of the time use the greenhouse because it's very easy to ventilate it. I can leave all the windows and doors open and um, yeah, it's very useful. And also having it directly in the garden means I don't have to take things very far. So I just wanted to give you some examples of what I grow in my garden that I can't find elsewhere. So. Um, on the left here is Weld, which is a really brilliant um, dye plant for yellows. So this is actually, you can find wild weld in Buckinghamshire along the, along the canals by near um, Aylesbury. There's some really beautiful wild weld, but this makes a beautiful, vibrant yellow. 
and then the marigolds at the top these are just marigolds that you, you know you find at the garden center they are a fantastic dye plant they're native to mexico and they make really gorgeous sort of deep mustard color and then the coreopsis which is in the bottom right this is a fantastic dye color um, i think it's native to north america and it makes a amazing red like a very like sharp bright orangey red it's beautiful and you just it's very unassuming from these little yellow flowers it's brilliant so also this is some apple bark so this is fruit trees and all fruit trees so plum apple pear these things all make really beautiful dyes so it is possible to make a really vibrant and varied palette if you have a dye garden so you you know you can get a full rainbow pretty much from a dye garden because of you can obviously choose what is available and what you know what you what colors you want to achieve and there's a lot more control with a dye garden so you can essentially curate your palette whereas when you're foraging the i, I what i find really interesting about the foraging is the control is kind of taken away. It, you, you're you working with the resources that are there. And in some ways I find that more interesting to be honest. So foraging plants for, dye, for dyeing is a really good way to build a palette from the plants in your locality. So it really is a nice way to reflect the ecology that, that surrounds your home. And I think this is just something that you don't get from a dye garden. So it's, it's a really, what a, a palette from a dye garden will reflect the dye garden, but to reflect the ecology that just happens to be there, I think there's something really um, beautiful about that. And I'm really interested in this idea of a square mile or the Mithla Square in Welsh, which is a really strong tradition of engaging with the um, immediate landscape around you and which with the intention of generating a sense of belonging. And I think foraging for dye plants is a really great way to do this because you can sort of fill your home with these colors that reflect, reflect the ecologies from around you. And it really gives you a sense of understanding what it is that grows around your home. So when you do this, you learn so much about the plants that you see on your walks. You, it changes your whole relationship with those plants and with the seasons and just gives a really deep sense of um, belonging in, in your landscape. So a palette of color can be derived from almost any environment, whether that's urban or rural. This isn't necessarily something you have to live in the beautiful countryside to be able to do. Um, Obviously, I'm usually based in, in the countryside, in the Chilterns, but recently, so for lockdown, I'm actually in North London, and it's been a really good proof of concept to have to uh, develop a colour palette in an urban landscape. And it's been really interesting because whereby in the countryside, most of the things that you might forage for will be native or, you know, it's it will be things that you'll see time and time again in, in the specific um, countryside that you live in. Whereas in the city, people have planted things and there'll be things that are not native and things that are much more exotic and unexpected, which I think is really, um, you know, full of surprises. So there's, there's pros and cons to both, but they're both very interesting. Um, so yeah, what I like to think the color contains a lot of information about place. So if you make this palette, as I was saying, you then you're basically creating a sort of um, map of the plants, a sort of abstracted map of the plants around where you live. So this this image on the right here is a colour palette from um, a sort of lacy green area, square mile um, from October. And so the pink, the, the bright pink is from Slows, the softer pink in the corner is from um, dock root, the orange is from agrimony, the peach is from hawthorn, as is the sort of lighter peach, the yellow, and then the greys are um, also from plants within that palette, but 
they have been modified, but I'll, I'll go into that shortly. Um, so I saw that in the polls, several of you are um, seasoned foragers, but um, I always like to share ethical foraging tips because I think it's a really nice thing to keep in mind in order to keep a sort of symbiotic relationship with the plants that you're working with. So I would say it's best to only pick where specimens are abundant. If you can only find one or two, leave them where they are. And again, this is where uh, a dye garden comes in handy because then if you really love something and there's not much of it around, you can grow it. Um, do not, these are all kind of common sense things, but they're good to keep in mind. Do not strip a site bare. Um, don't take more than you need. Um, using a knife or secateurs, this is a really good tip because um, it, it is less likely to cause damage to the, the plant that you're taking from. So sometimes if you, say if you rip a branch off a tree, that, that exposed area could then become diseased and a clean cut is always much better. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, grow it yourself is, is a really good option if, if these things aren't abundant. And you don't necessarily need um, a whole garden. There's obviously ways of growing things that, you know, you can do in window boxes or in an allotment or that there's ways of being creative, right? You can even do it in your kitchen. So this is an image from Flora Arbuthnot. She um, has brilliant resources on, on plants and colour online if you're interested, but I think it's always good to mention when talking about foraging things that are best to avoid. So there's the foxglove, the arum lily, the dog's mercury, hemlock, obviously these things are all very poisonous. And although some of them, for example, foxglove can produce a color, I would just avoid them because they, it's not worth it. <laughs> and then there's bryony and spindle tree. These are also um, very poisonous. So what I use when I go foraging, which is incredibly useful, is an app called Picture This. There are other apps that are really similar, but I, I really get on with this one because it's pretty accurate and I often get um, a, a really good, good result. So basically you take a photo of the plant and through sort of artificial intelligence, it would tell you an algorithmic, um, technology essentially it will, it will compare it to thousands of other images of the same plant and show and tell you what the plant is and it will give you the, the common names the latin name um and then other names that it's also known as but what it also does is goes into detail about the plant which i think is a really interesting um feature in that you can learn a lot about you know its history and its uses and its care tips so it's it's really it's a really fast track way to um being able to identify um the plants when you're foraging and then building up what you can save there's a feature called um my garden on it which means you save each plant and then you have like a collection of these plants and you know you know you can come back to them over and over again and, and when you need to research it um, you can see you can see what you've identified previously. So when I'm talking about site specific color palettes, I think it's really good to have a way of mapping these walks. So I use the OS Maps app, which you can record walks on. So what I tend to do is I record, I go on a walk and record the walk on the app. And then once the walk is finished, when I saved in the notes, I'll save everything that I spotted on that walk. So I won't necessarily pinpoint exactly where I found it, but um, the idea being that if I were to repeat that walk, especially at that time of year, the idea being I'd be able to find the same plants again. And then to make a time specific um, palette, it's really nice to um, just keep a note, a sort of loose calendar or diary of what's available when, as you start to build that knowledge. So this is, as I showed, I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of um, time-specific, site-specific uh, palettes from foraging. So this is the one I showed you earlier. This was an October palette, and this was in Lacey Green or the, the surrounding area. 
and this was also in the same area, but this was in August. So you can see there is a difference and the, the route may have been different and but it makes a huge difference the time of year and and the walk you go on and I think it's a really nice way to document a space and a time. So mordants and modifiers this is a really important um, skill and, and piece of knowledge and is something that's so tempting to skip over when you want to make colour and it's something that I have skipped over many times and I always regret doing this because so mordanting is um, the process of, of fixing, basically preparing a fiber so you can um, the fiber can accept the color, which means when you dye the fabric, the basically mordant bite is a, is a substance that will bite into the fabric, making it more porous and meaning the the um, the fabric can hold the color. So the color the fabric becomes more light fast more colour fast and more permanent. So it's never a thing to skip over. And there are many, many, many ways of mordanting, so many techniques and so many different things you can use. Um, I will put some resources to further um, tips on mordanting at the end if it's something that you're interested in, in researching a bit more. Um, but the two most common are alum, which is really uh, the best for protein fibers so silks and wools etc and then aluminium acetate these two are not to be confused they do a very different job and they have a very similar name um, for cellulose so cotton linen bamboo natural fibers from plants um, and then safety is also really important these things some of them can be a bit corrosive or a bit irritating especially the very fine powders so it's always good to wear um, a mask and gloves and to do this in um, a well ventilated place and not to use the same utensils you use in the kitchen sort of common sense things but um, worth mentioning so pre mordanting I find is the best way to mordant so is to do the um, mordanting before you so you prepare the fiber long before it ever goes into the dye bath so some people do something called an all-in-one dye pot where they add the mordant or the mordant substance to the dye bath. This is effective, but I, I don't personally think it's as effective as, as preparing the fibers before. So um, as I said, I'll, I'll provide some more resources for, for further reading on mordanting at the end. But um, another important thing to mention is before you mordant, it's really important to scour the fibers. So. This is a process where um, it basically removes any wool, oh, sorry, any oils or waxes or treatments on, on the fibres. So this, this can be done in a number of ways. I tend to just soak my fibres in warm water with fairy liquid or something, because something that can cut through grease and you'll see the colour of, of the liquid, the water afterwards, and it will often have taken on a sort of yellowish colour or and it would, where the waxes and treatments are just left there um left the fibers it's a really important um part of the process so i just thought i'd run over that before we um go into further um detail so i thought this would be a nice mordant to mention as a sort of theme of food waste um is coming up here so rhubarb leaves are a really fantastic mordant especially for cellulose fibers so for your um cottons and linens and calicos so rhubarb leaves contain oxalic acid, which, which bites into the fiber to create a really great um, mordant. So the method is to place the rhubarb leaves in a large dye pot and then simmer this for two hours. I think two hours is, is sufficient in a well ventilated area. You can do it for longer, but I think two hours is fine. And then when you strain the liquid and take the leaves out, you have a um, really strong solution for adding the, um, the scoured fibres into your um, rhubarb mortar and, and then you allow this to cool. And then when you remove the, the calico or the, the any of the cellulose fibres that you use, those will then be mordanted. So that's really fun. So if you grow more a rhubarb or even if you buy rhubarb, the leaves are very useful for dyeing. 
Um, modifiers are anything that um, changes or affects the colour of of the natural dye. Um, there are hundreds of ways to do this, and I think what's really interesting about natural dyes is the variables and how um, there's never essentially a right or a wrong or, or a particular way of doing things. And as with all the methods I'll share with you, they, they are just one way of doing things. And um, I particularly like iron as a modifier because it has a really strong effect. So iron reacts with the tannins in um, natural dyes. So lots of natural dyes contain lots of tannins. So often barks, um, roots, leaves, all of these things can tend to be very tannin rich. And therefore, when you mix them with iron, they have a huge impact. So on, on the right here, the top image is um, dyes made from dock root. And the bottom image is exactly the same dye, but with an iron modifier. And you can see how the tannin just deepens and saddens the color with the iron. So I would say the best way to do this, there are many, many ways to do this, but I tend to prepare like a big tub or like um, vat in a, you can have a big, a big pan or a big bowl or something with um, one or two teaspoons of ferrous sulfate dissolved into the water. And then that can act as your iron bath or your iron wash. So once you've taken your dyed fibers out of the dye bath, you can then dip that, once they rinse, you can then dip them into the um, iron bath and it, you'll get an entirely different color. It's really useful and, and a really good way to keep, um, to get a very varied palette. And um, this is something that I have used a lot for this site specific, time specific um, palette that I'll share with you in a moment. The other thing that can really affect um, a dye color is, uh, pH. So acids, alkalis, they can have a huge impact. So th even the tap water of where you live. So I know where I work in the Chilterns, the tap water is incredibly alkaline. So my the colours that I make, if you're somewhere else with with softer water, you could use exactly the same plant and you'd you'd come with a different result. It's it's a really fascinating element to how these colors are so hyper local it's just it's just another le level to um to demonstrate just how important and specific to where you are that these colors will be and and i think that's a really beautiful um part of of natural dyeing so you can use um calcium carbonate which is chalk i sometimes use chalk that i find on walks in the chilterns you can just even put put just like a, a chunk of it into the water or you can um you can like uh, put it in a pestle and mortar and put it in, in a powder form and then to get acid you can add lemon juice vinegar anything like that and it's amazing the color can just entirely transform like in seconds it's, it's a really fascinating way to, to play, experiment with the, with the um with modifying your colors so this is a really good example here. So this is from um, Chris Nichols, who is a Buckinghamshire-based natural dyer. So this is a really, really good demonstration of how one plant can achieve all of these colors with different um, mordants and modifiers and pH levels. And it just is a really good way to show that the variables of, of these techniques. And I think that's really fascinating. It's not, it's never that, this plant equals this color. It's always it's always a, a really broad range of what you can achieve, and I I think it's that's another great thing about natural dyeing because it can just it's kind of infinite. You can just experiment and experiment and experiment, and there are, there's always another outcome you can achieve. So now I'm just going to take you through the um, the site specific and time specific. Um, palette that I've made this week. So this is just to demonstrate that if you really isolate the time and the, and the, um, the space, what you can achieve just from that particular area. And this is just one sort of walk that I've been doing daily and what I've collected and, and how, um, how that then translates into a color palette. 
So this color palette is made up from sumac flowers, which I would never have found in the Chilterns. They're not native to this country. Um, beech leaves, mountain ash leaves, marigold, bay leaves, another thing I wouldn't have found um, if they weren't planted, acorns and willow. So as I mentioned, um, there are so many methods to these things. So I've tried to keep a sort of generalized and very simple method that um, you might like to try, but as always, you can look these things up and there are hundreds of ways of processing the same plants. So the sumac is this beautiful plant here with this red um, sort of flower that grows on it. So I collected a few of these over a number of days and there really weren't very many of them, but I, um, that, that I took, but I left them to steep overnight and simmered them gently. So with any dye plants, it's always good to avoid just cooking them, you know? So once, once you cook them, you kind of, you can destroy the color. So it's always good to just gently coax the color out of these plant materials. Um, and then after they were simmered, I strained the flowers and added the scoured mordant fibers and then simmered for um, a further 20 to 30 minutes. And then I rinsed and then, um, so as you can see, there's two really different shades I got. So the bottom one is um, as it is, and then the top one is with iron and it create, it doesn't, the image doesn't do this particular shade justice. It was like, deep blue, almost into purpley black, the way that a blackberry is, it's, it was beautiful. Um, and then this is Mexican marigold, this is growing on um, my friend's allotment, it's really beautiful. And as you can see, you can get two really distinct colors. There's an olive green, and then a sort of brightish, almost mustard yellow. Um, the method with this was to, um, very similar, but again, a very gentle method of, of coaxing the color out, not letting it boil. Um, and then uh, simmering and then being patient with, so you can get quite a bright color within 15 minutes of the simmering, but for a deeper color, the, the patience is, is really key. And then again, with the iron bath, I, it brought out this beautiful olive green just it's just incredible how the tannins just react and it's so quick it's a minute leave it in for a minute and take it out and it's it's an it's an entirely different color um beech leaves and mountain ash leaves i put these next to each other in the image as you can see they're incredibly similar colors and i used a pretty much identical method so i've decided to group them together because I don't see why you'd need to do both. <laughs> so it's um, the method is slightly longer with this one in terms of there's longer soak time. Um, you leave this for several days and um, with some soda ash, which is an alkaline, but also helps to um, coax the color out a little bit. And then you stir it a little bit every day, just once a day to check on the color and encourage the, the color to, to come out from the leaves. And then when you're happy with the color, when, when the water is a sort of brown gold, um, simmer this for a little bit longer um, until the color deepens and then strain these leaves and then add the fibers. Um, and the rest is very similar to the other. So I try to keep it as a sort of format of, um, of, of, of process. So they try to treat all the plants as similarly as possible. So it's this method that can be repeated, but adjusted just ever so slightly depending on the plant. I mean, there are lots of plants that require much more complex um, processes like, um, for example, indigo or woad where, you know, there, there are hundreds of ways of doing it, but they're much longer. They involve like fermenting and aerating and they're amazing, but they're it, this this approach will not work with them. Um, then rosemary and bay, these were really beautiful to work with. They were so herbaceous and beautiful smells. Sometimes the smells from natural dyes can be very earthy, which I personally really like, but not everyone <laughs> likes. Um, the but working with rosemary and bay just was like very very nice. Um, 
smell to fill the room with. It's beautiful. So again, I've grouped these two together because they had very similar um, process in that they're both sort of woody herbs. And as you can see, the, the colors are not dissimilar. So it's kind of this, the bottom is bay here. So you have this sort of orangey pink and a pink and then a greenish gray. And the rosemary at the top is a pink and also a greenish gray. So that will have something to do with the chemicals that are inherent in the plant. It would usually be a combination of um, flavonoids and tannins, which, which cause these colors. And obviously anything with tannins will react with the iron, hence getting this, this separate shade. So with the woody herbs, with like the rosemary and the bay, um, I just steep them overnight, almost like just making a giant tea, basically. And in the morning, I noticed that the the water had taken on a golden colour, but I needed to to sort of take it further than that. So I simmered them for gen gently for twenty minutes, and sort of kept repeating this. Um, I don't know, maybe two or three times, and always trying to avoid cooking them. That's I, I would say that's the really crucial thing with all of these things because once you cook it, it's kind of you know, you're not going to get any color, more color out of it once it's sort of boiled. Um, and then um, strained this and then added the mordant fibers again, as this is a sort of format of, of method, um, it's very, the end is usually very similar. This is the beginning that tends to need tweaking um, based on what plant material you're using. So um, simmered that for 45 minutes. Which so this took a little bit longer. I think it's because the colour was quite um, needed coaxing out of the leaves a little bit more. But as you can see, you get this really beautiful sort of corally um, pink from this. Um, and then yes, yeah, the as you can see that the iron creates these sort of green greys, which are really beautiful too. And then I think willow is the last one from this yeah so willow is a really brilliant plant for um using for natural dyes you can use the bark and you can use the leaves but for this i use the leaves so um i didn't use altogether too many but maybe a sort of um three or four handfuls of, of leaves so I, I stripped the willow leaves and left to soak for a day or two just in a tupperware box and then um, warmed them for 20 minutes until the, the water took on a sort of warm um, shade. It sort of moves from yellow further into an orange and then beyond that into, into a red. And then um, added the fibers, simmered further, rinsed, and then an iron bath. So you can see with the willow, the, sh the two shades are particularly strong, this sort of bright, um, orange and then this this quite sh strong grey which comes through which I think is really beautiful. Um, so at the end of your dye bath what you'll find is there's a lot of liquid left so there's a lot of very precious colour left in this liquid and it always seems a shame to me to just pour that down the sink so I'm always looking for ways to preserve it or to use it for something else and and to find um other ways to to use this this sort of precious color so the first thing you can do is you can make um an ink this is a very simple process whereby it's essentially just reducing like in cooking so you reduce the the vat to a much more saturated um solution and then once it's a very strong solution, you can just put this in a jar and to stop this going um, off or going moldy, you can add um, cloves. So you can use um, clove oil or you can even just put a couple of cloves into the jar and this works a treat and um, keeps everything fresh and makes all your inks smell really Christmassy. <laughs> um, you can use gum arabic as a binder, but also cherry sap is really good if you can get hold of it cherry sap is a really um interesting way of um keeping kick you know um making sure that the the color doesn't bleed into the paper so if, you, if you're interested in in using this as ink a binder is is really necessary um 
And I'll give you a quick recipe for acorn ink, which is a, re a really good one for a sort of black ink, a sort of standard black ink. So acorns are really high in tannins. So as, as you will have um, learned previously, they, with iron, you can make a really, really black ink from with acorns and oak galls as well. So if you um, soak the acorns overnight and simmer for an hour or two, and then add um, ferrous sulfate, so um, iron oxide, and then strain the acorns and reduce again, like in the, the ink method, until sufficiently opaque, you can cre create this brilliant black ink that you can use for drawing and um, printing, etc. It's really um, a really fun method. And then again, preserving this with the cloves, I mean, you, you can use it whenever you need it. Um, lake pigment is another fun one. So this is to create a powder, um, from your from your dye bath, you add alum to the dye bath, and then the the dye molecules attach themselves essentially to the um, to the alum, which all uh, sinks to the bottom. After a few days, you end up with a solution where the top is is very clear, and the bottom is very opaque. You can pour off the top, and then strain the more opaque section and dry this out in a, in a filter in a coffee paper, and then um, then you're left. What you're left with when it's dry is a, is a lake pigment, which which can be turned, which is no longer water soluble. So you can't um, add um, water back to it, but you can turn it into paint. And there are methods for that. As I, what I didn't mention about the ink is an, that's another really good way of storing dye baths because with many dye plants you can add water to them again once it's an ink and it's a dye again. So it's just a great way of storing it if you haven't got a huge amount of space. And then the last method for um, using up your dye baths is um, making paints from them. So th this is a really interesting thing that I've started um, experimenting with. So you can use gypsum, which is often used for um, interiors and hydraulic lime, which is corrosive. So be very careful with this, but um, you, they can use them um, as binders for botanical paint. So with this, I had a Coreopsis dye bath, which is like a bright red, but mixed with um, gypsum and with lime, made these really great sort of coral paints. And then these, um, you can't store these once you've made them, so because they will go off, in turn, they will go hard basically, but um, they, they're a really nice way to, to add color to surfaces um, and to, avoid waste from your um, dye baths. So there's a couple of um, reading and resources here. So these two books, um, Abigail Booth's Wild Dye and Jenny Dean's Wild Color, especially, they're really good um, resources for foraging natural dyes and um, give you a lot of insight into the process if, if you want to. So I, what I, my intention today was to just give an overview of what is possible in in um in foraging for natural dyes but these are you know if you want to go into more depth these are these are really good resources um the art and science of natural dyes is a fantastic resource for understanding the more chemical principles of of the processes because it is essentially an applied science so it's a really good way to um to achieve more depth of of understanding of, of what is happening exactly when you're extracting these colors. And then Vegetable Dyes by Ethel Merritt is a brilliant resource for um, a more historical understanding of, of these dyes. So this is from 1917 and she's just brilliant. She's, she's a really um, a real talent actually, Ethel Merritt. So yeah, th these, are, these resources I would all uh, really recommend if, if you would like to. Um, do some further um, investigating on the subject. These are the um, uh, protein fiber and cellulose fiber um, methods I mentioned. I can paste these into the chat if you're um, interested uh, in, in, in looking into these a little bit more. As I say, it's a really, um, really important stage in natural dye. So I think now we're onto questions so I can stop sharing my screen. And um, there we go. 
I see there's quite a few in the chat. Let's have a look. I thought it was best to wait till the end to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for your time, guys. Thanks for listening. So I believe, yeah, the first one um, would have been around, does each raised bed have a separate plant type in your garden? In my garden, yes. So I like to treat my garden as um, a very functional garden. I, It's actually an old um, working garden, like a kitchen garden. So I quite like the idea of keeping the sort of format of that going, but it's not necessary. You can have a gorgeous garden with everything integrated and do all your companion planting and and still have lovely dye plants but I there's something I quite like about treating it as a very functional sort of crop um the next question I don't know if people want to ask their questions I know you had yours next Charmaine hi yes thanks a lot Thanks, Rachel. Um, that was really, really interesting. I loved it. Um, I was asking about the spectrum of colours because you said you can get a wide spectrum of like the full rainbow of colours. Can you get that all year round or is it sort of say summer's the best or autumn the best time to get a full range of colours or are there colours that come out more during certain times? That's a really good question. Um, it all depends. So there are I'd say with, with getting blues, I'd say the most reliable blues are woad and indigo, which in this country really are sort of mid late summer colors. Um, with everything else, I would pretty much say you'd be able to get um, green. Yeah, I'd say it, it, not exactly the same shades. And what's really interesting is the same plants used at different times of the year can give you a different color. So for example, dock root, can give you sort of peachy pinks at one time of the year and then later in the year will give you um, darker colors. So there's always a way of getting, um, you know, a, a sort of rainbow, but it won't necessarily be precisely repeatable. Does that that's answer? Quite, yeah, that's brilliant. That's quite nice though, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brilliant, thanks a lot. I think Jenny had some questions. I don't know if you want to ask those. Oh, okay. I think, is Jenny here? Oh yeah. Um, do you want me to ask them for you? Maybe I, I unmute Jenny. Hello. Hi Jenny, how are you doing? Hiya. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I think you might have already answered it anyway, the, the um, rose bay willow, what general colour does that give you? Do you know? Rose bay willow? Mm-hmm. I don't know this tree, the rose bay willow. It's a plant, it's not a tree. It's a, it's oh. a tall plant with with um, vibrant pink flowers. It's very, very oh, common in like, the island. I know what you mean, like willow herb. Yeah, Is it like, right, yeah. yeah. Different um, names. <laughs> different names, they might, they might even be separate plants. I know, I know what you mean, like from your description, this long plant with the pink flowers, I call it willow herb, but um, they may be different species, but I haven't actually experimented with those. It might be worth giving it a go. I've not read anything about um, willow herb or rose bay willow, but um, I would really encourage you to to um, try this this method and see um, if you can get any color out of, out of them, or just um, just some googling sometimes is really useful when when you've just identified a plant and and want to see if anyone's managed to um, make any color from it. There are a lot of like blogs and communities of people who who um, make natural colour. So there's lots out there. Thank you. And I wanted to ask as well, the natural paint, so mm -hmm. the paint that you made, can you use that outside or would the rain cause it to run? This is a really good question. I haven't tested that outside, but lime, I think lime is fine outside, hydraulic lime. So I would experiment, maybe just, just if you tried it out and then maybe put it on um, some timber outdoors and, right. and see what happens just on a sample. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, Laura asked if you could have the recipes for the inks, if, if you're happy to. Yeah, the inks. Um, yeah. I mean, we can share them afterwards. Sure, sure, sure. Um, the ink 
is just the dye bath reduced. So the ink is just the, the um, whatever's left over in your dye bath, essentially simmering it until the, it's just a saturated um, solution of, of your, um, of your dye bath. And then, yeah, as I say, using, a, using binders like um, gum arabic and clove as, as a preservative, but yeah, it's, it's a very simple um, method. Um, there's a question here, where do you buy your alum and aluminium acetate? I, there's a really good um, source on eBay actually, where this woman whose his username is the wonky weaver, but she sells um, alum and aluminium acetate in, in various quantities. So it's really good. You can just buy 25 grams if you want to um, experiment or if you, if, if you are then more comfortable with the process, you can buy more. So it's a really good way to, to buy a small amount and know that you're not wasting it if, if you decide that it doesn't work for you. Uh, rhubarb leaves. Oh, I'm glad you found that interesting. Sumac, yep. Let's have a look for more. Um, about dyes from fruits, like quince. Quince, that's interesting. So quince bark would be really, um, I would suspect you'd get a very strong yellowy orange from a quince bark. It'd be really interesting to experiment with that. I don't know about the fruit itself. I'm not sure. Again, um, it's always worth experimenting with these things. But no, I haven't tried quits. That would be really, um, really interesting. But yeah, the bark almost certainly would be a really useful dye material. Oh, okay, so you, the, the instructions for willow leaf dye. Um, it's, so with the willow leaf dye, so soak for two days, simmer, strain that's essentially it simmer strain and then add the um uh the fibers so the sky scoured and modented fibers to the vat and um then the iron bath if you like or another modifier so an acid or an alkaline is also um useful and my jumper no i don't know and it's made in scotland <laughs> I don't know if it's made from natural dyes. I don't think it is. I don't think it is, but it's it's um, it is handmade. Um, what, about weeds? what about weeds? Well, it depends what you consider a weed, because <laughs> there are lots of wild flowers or uh, or things that are known as noxious weed, like weeds like uh, goldenrod, for example, is a brilliant dye plant dock is a really good dye plant wild carrot lots of so-called weeds are really really used and wild, wild um herbaceous perennials essentially which lots of people consider to be noxious and and um invasive can be really really useful budlia budlia is a brilliant dye so budlia tops if you simmer them if you can use this this method actually that i um demonstrated with budlia tops they create a beautiful yellow. They're really great. And again, they react really well with um, iron. So you'll get a huge contrast between the yellow from the Buddleia and, and the, the um, darker tone from the iron. Bindweed? I have tried bindweed. <laughs> <laughs> because it is obviously a, a nightmare and I was just desperate to... Um, find some way of hating it less but um <laughs> I, I did get a color from it but it wasn't particularly beautiful and it didn't smell very nice so yeah you can by all means try it and I'm, I wonder if somebody using a different method or somebody might have a trick up their sleeves for making a beautiful color from it but the color that I got was this kind of weak beigey yellow it was just like it reinforced my hatred of it <laughs> I think T-Gel asked about where the best place to find equipment was, like dye pots. Um, yeah, and if steeping is the best kept covered outside to reduce the smell. Yeah, if you don't 
with certain things, so with my general rule in terms of inside outside is if it's edible and if you don't mind the smell, it, inside is fine. And if, you, yeah, but if it's not edible and you don't, or you don't like the smell, outside is best. So it's, it's entirely up to you. It's more of a sort of safety thing rather like, and a preference thing, but yeah. It, in like you, steeping rosemary inside is not a problem because if you really wanted to you could drink it for example but um yeah it's in terms of finding the equipment uh it depends on your budget actually um cook shops are really good so like um especially ones for catering so for big dye pots of um catering shops ebay brilliant i mean i i love ebay for everything um because there's so many brilliant secondhand things that you can find that are often difficult to find elsewhere. Um, or even Gumtree, places like that. Um, but yeah, for, for new things, cook shops for secondhand things, eBay is really good. Um, Budlier grasses. You know, I don't know a lot about grasses. I'd be really interested to do some, some research into that in the in next spring, summer. Ivy gives a lovely colour. I've used ivy berries. I haven't used ivy leaves. Laura, would you mind telling me about the um, ivy? Uh, hi, Rachel. Yeah, um, from the ivy leaves, I got a lovely um, rich green colour. And then by adding an iron uh, modifier, I got a, a great greeny grey uh, lovely sort of almost like a sagey green, uh, green it was really nice beautiful and what was the method that you used to get the the green color uh, quite similar to to what you normally do uh mm -hmm. sort of similar similar times i tend to you, you tend to do yours for about 20 minutes i tend to do it for about an hour mm -hmm. but um essentially it's the same thing i i and I don't even quite simmer. I just get it so that there's steam coming off it, but yeah. it's not. There's no bubbling or anything. It's just there's heat there, and and that's it. And I try and do it in as big a pot as possible so that it's not going to dry out. Mm -hmm. Or, but but that's about it. But uh, but very similar methods to yourself. Thanks, Laura. I'll, I'll try that. It sounds beautiful. Um, Rowan berries. I haven't tried rowan berries. I've tried mountain ash leaves, but I haven't tried the berries. Has anyone else tried them? No. Other modifiers. Um, let's have a think. There, I guess um, the uh, playing with pH is a way to modify the colour. Other modifiers, I would say um, alum can be a modifier because it's, it's quite acidic. Um, the, the resource that I recommended, the Art and Science of Natural Dyes, is absolutely full of that chemical information. It's really um, copper. That's that's yeah. So metals, metal salts, metal solutions. So copper, aluminium oxide, um, iron. These things seem to have a real um, reaction and, and modify um, the color that you can achieve. Copper. Magnesium flakes. I haven't tried that. That sounds really interesting. Um, copper pot to adjust color is a really good um, point, actually. I it was recommended to me to use an aluminium pot, not to adjust the color, but to achieve a bright color. A steel can produce steel pots can produce a duller color. Um, I guess that's just a preference. I think also aluminium pots are these days actually easier to get hold of than steel pots so that's it's a kind of lucky um coincidence oh just gonna say i'm gonna stick a, a quick poll up just so that you give us our feedback because we have come to sort of our time um on this morning session um so if i can just stick that up if anybody you can it's multiple choice so there might be a couple of answers <laughs> that take your fancy there um that will be great you can still ask any other questions um whilst that's going ahead um i'd like to thank rachel this morning for being our uh, our first <laughs> session out the door 
on uh, Bucks Food Revolution. So thank you so much um, for sort of spending your time um, getting that together and being with us this morning. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to uh, just point out at the very beginning of the chat, we have um, a hamper draw, which is a zero waste winter hamper. If anybody would like to make a suggestion, um, your, your sort of key tip to reduce food waste in the home, uh, you can be entered into that draw for a zero uh, waste winter hamper. Um, so that's the very top of the chat. Um, if you'd like to enter, then that link there takes you to um, just a Google form to enter into that competition. So, are there any other sort of questions? So, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for all joining us this morning. If we are going to see you again during the weekend, I shall see you soon. Um, if not, then thank you very much. We, we can send out um, maybe a little bit of information um, after this presentation. We'll be getting in touch next week um, and hopefully we will let you know should we be putting any of the recordings together from across the weekend. So thank you very much for your time and have a lovely weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye.